atmosphere of Jesus, atmosphere of Jesus, for there's an atmosphere where nothing is impossible, no disease incurable, there's an atmosphere, there's an atmosphere when nothing is impossible and no um, So we're wanting to just have these sessions because seasons have shifted. Yes, yes. But it is possible that a season can shift and a person doesn't. Yes, and that means you can be in a different season of your life but not have the requisite responses for that season and that's how a lot of people miss seasons things have shifted but your mind is not shifting your understanding is not shifting it is so going to help me as soon as you settle guys you know as soon as you are able to just settle it will it will, it will help me I get easily distracted especially with a lot of movement so You know, in school, when you go to primary school, there's, there's what we call foundational phase. And foundational phase is grade one to four. Am I correct? Seven. The teachers? Seven. One to three. R to three. Okay, and then from three to... Intermediate to six. And then six to twelve. Senior phase, and then apostolic phase. <laughs> when God brings you in a season where He says, "I want, I want to fix your finances and your resources," usually the season of finances and resources precedes the season of divine purpose. Say divine purpose. Okay. Go to the book of Joel, chapter two, verse twenty-seven. I just want to explain to us why we've called these meetings. And by the way, when God is going to do something remarkable in your life, he comes to you by his word. God has chosen no other method to communicate himself to man except for the method of preaching. He doesn't work in other ways, but he works through the preaching of his word. That's why the Bible calls it the foolishness of preaching. To confine the wisdom of this world. There are no complicated ways by which God works with men except through teaching. Because teaching and preaching is the only system ordained for duplication. Do you guys know that edu the education system was actually built on discipleship? That over time when um, philosophers began to... Uh, um, Develop the education system. They had copied that from discipleship. Literally directly from what Jesus had said. Because nobody else was, was building an education system except for the church. It was only the church that was fulfilling what Jesus had said. When he said, make people disciples. Teach them to observe the things that I taught you. And then they started to see a system that the only way to advance men. Or the only way to bring civilizations is through education. That's why all civilizations of men are built on an education system. So no one is able to effectively interact with a civilization outside of education. There, are, there is also a spiritual civilization that you will not be able to live in unless you are well educated. Do you understand when I use the term civilization? I'm now talking about the systems of this world. Okay, look, look at how civilizations work. When you go to work, work is really a marketplace where you go to sell your skill. And when you go through an interview, you are assessed or audited on the basis of what you know and how what you know can contribute in moving this particular business forward economically. And what you are going to be paid, you are going to be paid on the basis of what you know. So, so we live in a civilization that's built on knowledge. 
when you go to school, you are, you are acquiring knowledge. It's knowledge acquisition. But this knowledge qualifies you to become something. You are a doctor on the basis of what you know about the, the human body. You are an, a mechanical engineer on the basis of what you have come to understand about mechanics. So, when you sit down to write a test and you get a 70%, that shows us two things. It shows us what you know and what you don't know. Shows us you, you still don't know 30% of the work. You can, you can still move on, you can pass. It's justified. That if you know 70%, have you, do you guys know that there's like examinations that you must get, like some you must get 60, some you must get 70, some, some 80. Like if you get less than 80. Um, so, so the more skill you acquire, the more value you have, uh, uh, you've, you increase your value on the basis of what you know. Uh, there's, a, there's a particular man who was, a, who was an engineer. Um, I'm told the story that uh, there, were, it, there was a, a large ship that broke down and they called experts and guys came and nobody could sort out this large vessel. And finally they said, well, let's go get the guys that were the initial team that, that built uh, this, this vessel. They got him, he, were, he, were, he, was, he, were, he had retired. They got him, he came. When he got there, in no time he sorted out the thing, literally in five minutes. And, uh, and I mean, the, the quotations for sorting out that problem was, was is in thousands of dollars. And somebody disputed with him to say, but you didn't do much. The figure that was put there was $25,000. Why must we give you, you didn't do, this hardly even took you Five minutes, and you're saying, you are not paying me because of what I did now, but you are paying me for the acquisition of my knowledge and experience for the past 30 years. So the better your knowledge, the better your experience, the higher your value. There are spiritual civilizations, spiritual economies, spiritual ecosystems that we are called to relate with in Christ. But... How accurate you relate to these systems depends on the knowledge that you have acquired. There is someone that wakes up every morning and by 5 p.m. they have made 10,000 rands in a day. Somebody else, same time. probably even in the same city. By 5 p.m., they've made 200 rands. And the difference between the 200 rands and the 10,000 rands in a day is the knowledge acquired. How well have you come to understand the economics of the city, the flow of money, and the value that's needed, and the places to go to to make sure that that money flows towards you? You know, during the, um, the, the, the HIV and AIDS pandemic in our country, uh, President Tabumpegi said a statement that made him unpopular. And he was saying, people don't die of HIV, people are dying of poverty. And it was a big hoo-ha. Let me ask you guys this question. Do you guys think that, you know, the way that HIV was killing particularly black people in sub Saharan Africa. Do you want to tell me that we are more immoral than the Americans? <laughs> Cannot be. You know the Americans, if you guys try just to look for a movie on a Saturday night, how difficult it is just to get a clean American movie. But what was killing people? Access to information. Because there was a time that people looked at HIV as a death sentence. A person gets diagnosed now, in three weeks they are gone. Because they were not killed by the sickness, they were killed by all, they were killed by the fear of the unknown. But with time as knowledge got dispensed, 
Like it's shocking right now if you hear that somebody has died of, of HIV. And what is saving men, some people never alter their behavior, but there's the knowledge that they acquired. And the knowledge we acquired is that this thing does not have to kill us. So in essence, what you know is that important and valuable. So a lot of us, the problem is a knowledge gap when it comes to our work with God. So I, I, I could be advancing, I could be prospering, but there is things that I don't know. Are yeah. I, you I, I with me? So, so this morning, this afternoon, I want to start by building the basics of getting you to understand what is available for you. Because what we are bringing, okay, financial prosperity. Okay, I wanted to explain something quickly with Joel, no? I said Joel 2, maybe, maybe try 70, uh, 22, let's try 22, just, just quickly, I want, I, wa I want to show you the two, the season we are in and the season that is going to come, and what is coming ahead of us, I'm now speaking to you prophetically, what is coming ahead is good, but many of us will be disadvantaged if we don't take care of the current season. Isn't it that even in, in the growth processes of man, you can't jump from 18 to 25. No, you must be 19 and 20. And I know some people try and jump. And they, and they suffer terribly. Mm. Is that? Is that jewel? Okay, maybe start from go to 23. Okay, 24. Okay, I want you to look, look at this, right? It says, and the floors shall be full of wheat. Fat shall overflow with wine and oil. When you see that in the scriptures, that relates to prosperity. Say prosperity. And I want you to say this with me. Say, it is God's will, is God's will that, I do well. that I do well. You know, there's a man of God who said this to me in 2019. When he said these words, it's like something really entered me. He said to me, it is God's will for you to succeed. And it was difficult for me because I come from a prolonged sustained season of difficulty where it looked like nothing works so when he said this thing I was like okay no I hear you so then that's why sometimes it's 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 not okay to struggle for too long it messes up with your mind it messes up with your identity okay so so so, so this scripture right now this is God talking about abundance it says the floors shall be full of wheat and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. Uh huh. Then he says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts had eaten, the canker worms, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent amongst you. Uh huh. And you shall eat in plenty. Say, eat in plenty. Eat in plenty. Says, and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that had dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Say, I shall never. Be ashamed. be ashamed. See that? If, if you find yourself in a situation where things just, it's like, you know, this is just shame. You know, either shame because I, I don't have enough money to take care of this and shame that I said I was going to pay for this at this time and I, and, I, I, and I did not. I want you to know that that in itself is not the will of God for your life. Because he said he should never put to shame in any ways. Okay. Right. One of the things that's going to happen and it's going to be a bit difficult uh, for some people is that we're going to try and uproot the spirit of poverty. But, but when something has a root in you, when it's uprooted, it's quite painful because it breaks the soil. 
right? So there's things that I'm going to say that some people are going to feel a little uncomfortable with. Uh, if you feel uncomfortable when we talk about financial prosperity, that uncomfortability is not you. It's a spirit that is plaguing your life at a particular level. And usually when it is challenged, it tries and reasons with truth. I want you to know this. You know, we are not... Um, We are not manipulators. I don't manipulate people for money. I don't. I don't have to. Because I understand that God liberally gives money. Right? So, so those of you guys that when you hear finances, resources, prosperity, once your guard goes up, just lower your guard. Just say, Holy Spirit, help me in this area of my life. Yeah? Just, just help me. Okay? Because... You cannot receive grace where you have not received truth. I'm going to show you right now in the Bible, there's something called financial grace. But that financial grace, it, 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 it follows the path of truth. Think, 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 think about truth as a stream that gets created. And think about grace as the water that flows on that, on, that, on that stream. So usually what the enemy does to rob people, he argues with truth in your mind. When truth is dispensed and disseminated, then there are arguments about, about this and about that. So don't allow for those. Just have your heart opened. Okay? Okay, I'm going to move, move, move on quickly from here. You shall eat plenty and then you shall not be ashamed. The next scripture. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. He says it again. You, you see this? God says, you will know I am God amongst you when you have plenty. Hey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. You will know that I am in the midst of thee and there is no other God except me. When your floors are overflowing with plenty. So prosperity could be a sign that the Lord is amongst us. Not, not the only sign, but it's one of the signs. Okay, let's, let's, let's continue. I'm going to show you something. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Do you see what follows? What? what says, now revival will come afterwards. But before I pour out my spirit, I must deal with you in the areas of prosperity. Because if I pour out my spirit and you are flowing in poverty, there, there is a danger that you will not understand the value of what you carry spiritually. So here's what's going to happen. We are at the verge of the afterwards. It shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. So we are at the verge. And it says, when I pour out my spirit, your sons and daughters will prophesy. There will be dreams. So there will be three things. There will be prophecies. There will be dreams. There will be visions. Do you see that? Prophecies, dreams, and visions. But prophecies, dreams, and visions follow prosperity. or uh, they, they, Prosperity follows them. In other words... It is possible that people could be carriers of the spirit. Okay, I, I want to put it. I want to put it well. God does not want you to be so dramatically prophetic, but you are not prosperous because you are. It is you are going to frustrate the grace that is on you. And you yourself are going to be frustrated by what you carry. And there are a lot of people that have wrong nuances in the things that they say. They, they misinterpret what they carry. Okay, I just want to make a, a, a quick example. It's so hot, but I have so much to say to you. And I think it's so important. Okay. Just say this to you. 
it, it, do, do you guys, I don't know if you guys were part of this era or this thing still continues. Have you ever heard somebody saying evangelists are, are, rude, are rude people? Yeah, or, you know that when, when you go to a tent crusade, they'll be swearing at people and telling people that they are whores, that they're going to die and go to hell. And <laughs> you, you guys, do you guys know, 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 that, know that era? Yeah. You see, you see, you know, you know what that is. That is when a gift learns in poverty. <laughs> the gift is a gift. You still see the results after they curse on people and everything. People still come to Jesus because of the workings of the power of that gift. But the basis on which the gift was disseminated will almost always leave the people who come to Christ in that way, feeling as if they are never good enough to God. Do you see that? It's the same thing that happens when there are dreams, when there are visions, when there are prophecies, but the issue of abundance has not been dealt with. So, so there's, there's, there's that balance. So what I want to say to you is that right now God has put us in a season where he says, I want to, I want to restore that which the canker worms, the locusts have eaten out, and I want to bring plenty because he's going to pour out his spirit. Are, are you guys with me? Okay. Now let's go to... Um, I've got a couple of scriptures. But maybe let's start it at um, Colossians chapter 1 in verse 16. Colossians 1, 16. Are we still waiting for the chairs? Okay. And the service is still on there, no? Okay. <laughs> We're waiting for the pastor. Tell Pastor George... Okay, so now that's, that's all right. Colossians chapter 1 in verse, in verse 16. I, I, I today, because I've got these three sessions with you, four if you're a partner. I, 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 so I guess you're going to start asking, what is a partner? Ne? How do I become a partner? Maybe let me just say this. So with the partners, we're going to have a master class. Um, a master class which is going to be a mixture of a, of a number of things. The master class is going to be a mixture of, because I would have given you some foundations, uh, we're going to build up a little bit on that financially and then we're going to shift into, into the prophetic. We're going to identify spirits that hold people back financially. But also one of the things that I'm going to do is that I'm specifically going to pray for people to be caught up in the spirit. Uh, just, just for you to see. Some people, when we prophesy them, they don't believe. Uh, just for them to see uh, what, what God really has for them. Something remarkable happened, I think about three or, or four weeks ago. I was asked to pray for a particular young man who has had a heart failure for three years. Um, and I said to him, you know, if I tell you where your heart is, you will not believe me. So I'll just pray for you to be caught up into a vision, uh, literally caught up in the vision, and that God will take you to go see where your, where, your, where your heart is. And I just commanded that two angels carry him, just carried him. And he says, firstly, he went down into a deep dungeon. Right at the bottom of a black deep dungeon was his heart in a case there. And I said, we don't even want that heart, that God will lift him up again into the spare parts of heaven, and that he will be given a brand, a, a brand new heart. Uh, on Tuesday, he was, he was going for uh, some examinations and stuff like that. They took him through all examinations, and they found that there was nothing wrong with his heart. So now he asked for the, the first examination that they had done, that he, he, that he has a heart failure. They have to put a, a, a patch on his heart, and uh, they have to monitor it over time. So he's wanting to have the two results that says, this is what happened before and this is how my heart is now after. But if I would have told him, he would have not believed and I knew it. He would have just thought, oh, no, you know. But now he himself, he knows that, no, my heart has been taken by the enemy. And if he has to contend for it, he can actually contend for it. 
You see that. So, so in the master class, that's some of the ways in which I will, I will pray. I will pray for, uh, for, for some of you. But, but f- for the sake of our exercise right now, Colossians 1.16, the Bible says, For by him were all things created. Say, all things created. All things created. That are in heaven and that are in earth. And then, do you see that? And, and that we already have a scriptural reference for. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that is Genesis 1.1. Do we agree? By him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth. So not only did he just create the, the earth, he created the earth and everything in it, the heavens and everything therein. That is uh, Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7, right? Now, the Bible says he created everything that is in heaven in it, in the earth in it. Then it says visible and invisible. So there are things that are invisible that are created. Now, that visible and invisible, it's as vast as the heavens and the earth. So there's a whole world that is visible, that is known world, and there's also an invisible world. Now, that invisible world is a world that affects me and you so much. You know, whether we know it or not, or accept it or not, there is a world that's invisible created all around us, and it affects who we are. Second Corinthians 5, 7. I want us to rush through these this sets of scriptures, and I want you to really grasp them. If you are not writing them down, somehow, type them down, okay? Type them down. Are we live? No, we are not live. Okay, so this will come up slightly later. Okay. Second Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith and not by... Okay. You got that? Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 to 18. The, the invisible world that was created... There are two types of beings that dwell in that world. is angelic beings and demonic beings. And both these beings have an interest in the visible known world. In such a way that there is nothing in your everyday life that is not determined by what takes place there. Everything that you see naturally is determined in the invisible world, or what we call the spirit world. It's, <coughs> we call it the spirit world because it's the world of spirits. Only spirits dwell in that world. But these spirits, they control what happens in your everyday life. That world has laws and rules. You yourself, you, you've got, you've got a, you are a special being because you are able to dwell in both these worlds. The, the, the natural known world and the invisible unknown world, you dwell in both. But everything that is natural takes command from the realms of the spirit in such a way that even things as simple and as unspiritual as money is also determined in that world. In that world, almost as if there were, there were discussions that took place as to, to whom does money flow to and who do we hold it back from. Do do, do you understand that? But that world has laws that rules that that, that world. Okay? Let me take take a scripture. No weapon formed against you shall. so, So there's a law that says weapons are not supposed to prosper. But also there's a law that says weapons must be formed. 
because it will be formed. No weapon formed. It doesn't, there's no law that says no way. No, 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 you can't, you can't do this. You can't form weapons. The weapons must be formed. Then there's another law that says the weapons cannot, cannot, cannot prosper. Okay, I'm going to try and, um, and, and be as simple as possible uh, about, 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 about this thing. There's a wisdom that I'm trying to navigate in bringing some truths across. Okay, Let, let's, let's put it this way. Do you understand that when we talk about money? Okay. I want to ask a question. Can I ask you guys a question? Who wants money? Okay. Loads of it. We, we, we all want money. Yeah. Not because you are greedy, ne? but because you've got some things that, Im- and immediately, ne? Like, like, you know, if I, like right now, you could take care of, of some things. And maybe some of us, you could even pray better. <laughs> no? Because you are, you are, the whole issue with your prayer life is because you are so distracted because there's this money thing that doesn't seem to be taken care of. Okay? Do, 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 do you agree? Okay. Let me say this to you. Money, isn't that we, we then call money a currency? Like the rand is a currency. The dollar is a currency. And the word currency comes from the word current. Right? And uh, as I, I made an example earlier about truth and knowledge on how the current is truth, the currency is the water. Or, let's put it this way. Um, when there are winds on the waters, the direction of that wind on the water, we call it a currency. So a currency is something that flows, right? I want to submit to you that all of us seated here, there are currents around us. There are currencies that flows around us. And these currencies are from the spiritual world into the natural world. Okay, I want to teach you this, this, this subject. So, right now, in the spirit, you are wealthy. Say, I'm wealthy. I am okay, let, let, me, let, me, let me show you. Go to Ephesians 2.5. I'm, I'm trying to find my, my foot. I'm going to say this in the next 15 minutes. It's going to make so much sense. Are you okay with that? Yes, Don't get distracted for the next few minutes. Ephesians 2.5. Ephesians 2.5. Even when we were dead in sin, he had quickened us together with Christ. That word quickening means he brought us alive or he brought us into life together with Christ. But how, what did he use to bring us into this life? By grace, you are saved. So there is something that exists in the world of God and this thing is called Grace. Right. Brother Salah, won't you just st- stand, 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 stand for me. Pastor Tala, won't you also stand? So, yeah, come, come, come a bit close. Face, face that direction. No, you, you stand next to him. Right. Maybe uh, Pastor Mike, won't you stand on that, on that pole? No, in, 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 in front of him. In front of him. Yeah. Go, 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 go back a little bit. Yeah. So, the Bible says... By grace, he raised us up from the dead. But there's something that he used for that big transaction to take place. And you understand that these are two worlds. One is alive, one is dead. And the, what is alive cannot enter the realm of death. Neither can the realm of death enter the, the, realm, the realm of life. The, these are two, two like the, both these worlds, they cannot coexist. But God, let's say Pastor Tabo is God, he released out of himself a, a special thing, something that had never been known to men. And this thing is called grace. 
It came from the depth of God the Father. And this grace, this thing called grace, this power of God called grace, it went into the realm of the dead, right? You go to Pastor Mike. Went to the realm of the dead and then took what was dead. It's the only power in the universe as you know it that is able to accomplish this thing. Nothing else can. And then it took what was dead. Pastor Mike, you go together back to. Now grace led death right into life. So that that which was dead has now become one with that which is alive. But it is the work of grace. And now what God has done. He's now, he now says, if I need to do anything, this is now the chosen vessel. Yes. So if you don't understand the workings of this vessel, you are going to struggle with these transactions. So this is what I've ordained for some transactions. Do you understand me? Okay, hold, hold, hold that thought on grace. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Pastor Mike, do you understand that side again? Pastor Stello, stand next to, to God there. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 8 in verse 9. The Bible says, For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what is grace. Grace is this special ordinance. This power that came out out of God and went into a place where life does not enter. Not only did it defy life, but it raised it raised up that which was dead and made it one with life. Now the Bible says we know this grace. Say I know grace. I know grace. This time around, look at what grace is going to accomplish. Knowing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though Jesus was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor that ye through his poverty, he might become what? But, but what moves you from poverty to richness is grace. Now, grace is free. You, you don't need to do anything. So, so this grace... Can I have uh, Pastor Tebu come, Pastor um, Mike come? Can you stand, stand behind him? No, yeah, turn the other way. And I want you to stand this side. Turn, okay, you stand here. No, 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 and, and face the people. Yeah, just, just come a bit close. Pastor Tebu, can you, can you look towards? Now, this is grace. And grace has many faces. Now, there is, the, the, the Bible talks about the manifold grace of God. 2 Peter chapter, chapter 4 and verse 9. And manifold means many-sided, right? Or it has many faces to it. You, some, you can meet grace and you meet him at the face of salvation. But it's not the end of him. If you fellowship with grace well enough, he's able to turn. Won't you guys just turn? Yeah? Once you have known the face of salvation, grace also has the face to make you rich. The same grace. But the Bible says knowing. Do you see that word there? No. That word there, knowing, is the word ginosko. Something that you know practically. It's not just head knowledge, it's hard knowledge. It's, it's knowledge that when you've received, you are persuaded of this truth. So we know that grace, it doesn't just save, but it also makes rich. Now this richness there is not the richness of the anointing or the richness of the presence of God. It's financial because when we have to study 2 Corinthians chapter 8 in context, you will realize that it's all about money. So there's a grace. And the Bible says it's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This grace now of wealth is able to move from the realms of God and come to the realms of man. But this grace can come and stand in front of you without you experiencing it. 
Okay. Go, 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 go back, Pastor Mike. Now give me Romans chapter 5 in verse 2. Romans chapter 5 in verse 2. So this is available. This, say, grace is mine. Grace is mine. But look at Romans 5 2. It says, by whom also we have access by faith into this. So now there's a grace to make rich. But the Bible says there is access. Say access. Access. And access is is a door. Or it's a place by which you enter. And the Bible says you enter this grace by faith. So if you will not believe it. Even though it's available you will not access it. So grace is provision. Grace is free. God has made these things available to us. So think about grace as money in the bank. Let's now shift Pastor Mike and call him faith. Grace is money in the bank, but faith is the ability to withdraw it. So it's possible that you are sitting with the grace for wealth, but you don't have the, you don't have the faith to withdraw from it. But, but what is going to build faith for that withdrawal is knowledge. Because faith begins where the will of God is known. So the question is, what do you know about the will of God when it comes to grace, for grace to make rich? Do you know that there's a grace that has just been sent? The face of grace, go to him. This face of grace is just sent for you to become rich. And God says... It's my provision. But you must appropriate it in, in your life by faith. Yes, sir. Okay, take your seats. Thank you so much. Why faith? Because, thank you, thank you guys. You can take your seats for now. I'm going to ask you again. Why faith? Because faith is the only thing that proceeds out of men to deal with the realm of the invisible. We do not walk by sight, we walk by faith. So faith is the only thing that causes for you to relate accurately with the realm of the invisible. Why do you need this ability? Because the grace to make rich is invisible. You can't see it with the eyes of the flesh. You can't reason it in the logics of men. You are going to need faith. I promise you. Faith truly, truly works by knowledge. It's because we don't know. Does this make sense to you guys? So the first thing that we need to now develop, the first thing we need to develop is knowledge. I know there's a grace to make rich. Say there's a grace grace. to to make rich. And I have been given divine right to that grace. Because when Jesus died, all grace was given to you. Yeah. Look, look at verse 7 of the, of the same, of the same, oh, sorry, of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So this thing, no, none of us are going to work. Ne? No, no, this is not by efforts. This is by grace. Grace to become rich is, a, is already, a, it's been available. <laughs> A friend of mine invited me to do something for a while. I didn't. When I was ready, I gave him a call. I said, man, I'm ready to, to do that thing. I think it's time. His response was, it's been time. <laughs> the thing has been available all this while. It's just been waiting for you. It's not like suddenly something has shifted. It's you who has to shift. But the thing is available. Okay, I I want you to to see this. It says, therefore, okay, maybe let's do, uh, do you have TPT there? Okay, let's try, let's try a much simpler version. I think God is about to cool us down, eh? It says, you do well and excel in every respect. Say, I excel excel in these respects. respects. 
and then he, he, gives, he gives you the respect. He says, you do well and excel in unstoppable faith. He says, you, you do well and you excel in, uh, in powerful preaching, in revelation knowledge, in passionate devotion. You never miss Friday night prayers. And in sharing the love we have to you. You see that? He says, you excel in these things. Some of you guys, if we just gave you the mic right now, everybody will be on their feet. Because you can bless us so much with revelation knowledge. Yeah? He says, he says the, you, you, you carry excellencies when it comes to this. Thing. If, if we said pray in the spirit, some of you guys are already praying 20, 30 tongues. Ne? You already, you've already downloaded it. We, we are still coming up. We are still in 2024 tongues. But you are six years ahead. He says it's well to excel. But look at what he says. He says, so make sure that you also excel in grace-filled generosity. Okay? There's a grace called generosity. Say generosity. Okay, next verse. Verse 8. I'm not saying this as though I were issuing an order, but to steer you to a greater love by mentioning the enthusiasm of the Macedonians as a challenge to you. Then he he brings a testimony. He says, you know, there are people called the Macedonians. And then he talks about their giving. Okay. Now, this grace... Okay. Pastor Mike, you were supposed to preach this afternoon. You are not preaching, so you have the strength of a preacher. (laughs) You can stand. Pastor Tatiso, can I ask just on that that pole, and maybe you you stand on this pole. Yeah, stand, uh, yeah. Say grace. Grace. Say faith. Faith. So here's a law that is now established. The law is that you cannot access grace without grace is the money in the bank. Faith is the ability to withdraw it. Have you ever seen somebody at the ATM not knowing how to withdraw money? Yeah, you, you, you get a security guard quickly. Eh? I've, I've got money, but hey, I, I don't know how to withdraw it. If help never comes for that person, okay, you guys want to settle down quickly? If you move quicker, it will, it will help me. I've, I've, got, I've got money. Let's just say you needed money for a taxi fare and you were in town and you were stranded. Somebody sends you money. But you have this money at the ATM. You remember when, when FNP introduced e-wallet? Yeah. Hey, man, that thing was uh, uh, disturbing a lot of us. Ne? Then the pin expires. Then the person says, but I can't do anything. You are the one who's supposed to do it. Like, you, know, you know all that, that, that confusion. And for a moment, you can be so stressed in a geographical area that you need to leave because there is money available but you don't know how to access it. It's not that the money is not there. It's the same thing with the grace to become rich. Not that that it isn't there, it's there. But there is, it, it takes a particular ability for you to withdraw, for you to access what is available. And that ability, Pastor, I might come to the side a little bit. Pastor Teddy, so just, yeah, just a little bit. No, you face, face the people, both of you. But this grace needs this faith. So now, what I then want to do is, I want to build this faith. I want to build this muscle because when I pray, it's, I'm no longer trying to get God to make this available because it's, it's already there and it is freely mine. Do, do, do you guys understand? It's, it's already here. You don't have to do anything. The grace for finances, you do not have to do anything. But the location of this grace is what we call the invisible world. Say invisible world. It's what we call the spirit world. Okay, Ephesians.
1, 3. Sure. Ephesians 1, 3, quickly. Please uh, just keep, keep standing here, guys. Ephesians 1, 3. I want to show you something quickly at Ephesians 1, 3. Uh, okay, let's, let's go back to uh, New King James. And any King James, as long as it's, it's King James. It says, blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the, the blessing, you know what is a blessing? The blessing is supernatural empowerment. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When this supernatural empowerment comes upon you, you start off on a Monday morning selling a bucket of cakes. By the time you get to day 15 of selling these cakes, your buckets have become seven buckets. And there is no logical explanation. You know what has simply happened? Is what you are doing is now receive divine enablement, divine empowerment. It's like David who stands before Goliath. So you become Goliath and this is David. Yeah, fa face, face him. When, when he takes a slingshot and he takes a stone, you must understand that Goliath is not just a, a big dumb dumb. Ne? Like he's just this big guy who's just so stupid. And No, he's a warrior. He has a profile. He has conquered nations, single-handedly conquered nations. He's coming out, one person coming out and swearing at the army of an entire nation. Nobody will dare go stop him. Now David comes with a little stone. When he throws the stone, it's not the stone. But what empowers the stone? There's a power behind the stone. That even if this stone hit Goliath on his big toe, he still would have fallen and he would have... So it's not what was thrown, but what sponsored. So when we talk about the blessing, is we are talking about the divine sponsor behind what you do. So when you say, I am blessed, you are saying, I am now going to bake cakes tomorrow morning. But when I bake these cakes, I bake the cakes with an acknowledgement. I'm not just doing it like the guy next to me. I acknowledge that there is something that sponsors me. It might be a little stone thrown at a big warrior who has conquered nations. But when I throw it, I throw it on the basis of testimony. Remember what he said? He said, hey, I killed a bear. I killed, I killed a lion. I, I, there is something that sponsored me. So, the Bible calls that the blessing. You know that the word to bless in the Greek is the word eulogy, which means to speak well. So, in other words, by the time I am baking these cakes, if I say I have a blessing, I mean that God has already spoken well about what I'm doing. That's why when you understand the blessing, you change your confession. You never allow yourself to speak anything that is contrary to what has already been spoken. Okay, are you with me? The Bible says he has blessed us with all. Say all. all. That means <laughs> it doesn't matter what type of blessing you need. It's already been given to you. But the blessing has a location. The Bible says in heavenly places. What is the heavenly places? Turn around. It's the spirit. It's this realm of the invisible. The blessing is here. But it's yours. It has your name on it. I promise you. The blessing has your name on it. The grace to become rich already has your name on it. But it's in heavenly places in Christ. Has a location. It's, and it's an invisible location. The only way, the only ability that man has... To enter that realm and interact with that realm well is this ability called faith. Because anything that you will not do by sight, you, you can do by faith. By the way, Hebrews 11.1, 1, the B part, it says faith is the evidence of the things that cannot be seen. You, you know what that means? It means 
My eyes cannot see the money, but faith says I possess the money. Why? Because faith would have now given me access to the locality, the geographical area where grace to become rich and the blessing is at. I, 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 are you with me, saints? I'm, I'm sort of repeating this because I want for you guys to, to understand this. The number one principle about faith. So how does that faith work? How can I then, by faith, access the grace to become rich? The number one thing about faith is that faith has works. Just as the spirit without a body is dead, so is faith without works. So faith is practical. You cannot say I believe God and then go and uh, have a sandwich. No. Faith is practical. The Faith has steps. Faith is sponsored by what you do. Okay. If you are trusting God, let's say for a job. Trusting God for a job. You now say, so in the spirit realm, by the grace that makes rich, my job is already there. Now what you want to find out is what are the corresponding actions to bring that job to me? Okay, okay. So, so, so it's, 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 it's behaving like God. Let me show you how God creates things. Okay? Genesis. Just go there quickly. Are you still with me, guys? Am I going on for too long? Not yet. Okay, second cor- ah, Genesis. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Is the heat becoming better? Yeah. Yeah, God knows this is important. He has to cool us down. Look at this. And God said, let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness. And then he said all these wonderful things. Let them have dominion. And then verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, male and female created he them. Now go to Genesis chapter 2. So I want us now to go back to Pastor Mike. God said, let us create men. And then God created men. Do you see that? Verse 26, he says there's a divine counsel. He presents the, um, the idea of men. And then in verse 27, man is created. Now, go to Genesis chapter 2. In verse 6 and 7. Genesis 2, 6 and 7. But there went up a mist from the earth. And watered the whole face of the ground. Yeah, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. But wait a minute. God had created man. He said, let's create man. And then man was created. In chapter 1. But again, in chapter 2, in verse 6, he forms man. Why? Because first man was created in the spirit. And he was finished. Now, God must have a natural corresponding action. He must now come to the dust and now do in the dust what he has finished in the spirit. Now, that's the same thing with grace and faith. Grace says to you, things have already been created for you in the spirit. They are fully yours. They have your name. There's already a job and a business and a ministry and anything that you need that is here. But then faith says I must now come to the natural world and begin to form what I have seen in the invisible. So that means faith gives you responsibility to work. You work by faith. How do I then work by faith? There are two divine instruments that faith uses to work. The number one instrument is the instrument of speaking. Say speaking. Okay, how, how does that work? Go to the book of Corinthians. I'll give you the verse just now. Second Corinthians 4.13. The first thing, isn't that now you are saying, okay, this faith, 
needs to access that grace. Hey, I'm desperate for that grace right now. And, and I, I, I don't need it seven years from now. Even in the next seven minutes. Yeah, let it, let, it must come and it has, to, it has to come right now. Yeah, some, there are things that I cannot afford for them to continue another week. That we, I've got to step into the coming week and some things need to change. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So now, the first thing, the instruments of faith. Because faith acknowledges that there is grace that we must access. And we've defined that grace. It's the grace to make rich. Huh? 2 Corinthians 4.13 We having the same spirit of faith. Now, James said this. He said, we didn't read it, but I, I guess many of us know it. If you don't know it, there's a scripture that says, faith without works is dead. And it likens works as a body and faith as a spirit you know like how when the when the spirit leaves a person a person drops dead i mean you know you know when a person drops dead it does not matter how well educated they are they immediately expire they become useless they cannot do anything for anyone when a man is dead he he could be the best medical doctor and they bring somebody that is so sick. Once the spirit leaves him, he's pointless. That's why the best thing we can do for this person is to bury them. So the Bible says, works. What you do is like a body. Faith is like the spirit. Now here's what, listen to what it says now. It says the same spirit of faith. So faith is a spirit. According as it is written, I believe. Say, I believe. believe. And therefore, I have spoken. Say it with me. Say, therefore, Therefore, I have spoken. spoken. Yeah, that's why the Bible says we also believe and therefore we speak. So the first thing that faith does, the first evidence that you have faith is when you speak. I I speak. But, But what does faith speaks? Faith speaks... What grace has made available. Pastor Jeff, won't you come stand here for me, please, sir? Say with me, say, faith Faith speaks speaks what grace grace has made available. available. Faith does not speak the reality of what is going on. And listen, faith, let's say you have a problem right now, as I know you do. Right? Because financial insufficiency is a problem. Not having enough money is a problem. Now, faith does not deny that the problem exists. So faith doesn't say, no, uh, money is there when money is not there. Right? But what does faith do? Faith denies the problem a place of influence. So when, when faith comes... Okay, you go forward a little bit. Yeah, you stand behind him. When faith... Oh, stand, stand up, Pastor Mike. Yeah. Faith says, okay, yeah, come a bit close. Faith says, yes, there's a problem here. But he, now faith... Pastor Mufenyo, won't you stand there? Faith then says... Let's just call that your destiny. Faith then says, you are not going to make decisions... On the basis of the trouble that you are in. So this trouble does not become a place of influence. This trouble. So now you are not going to plan. The next five years of your life. On the basis of what is currently taking place. Faith denies the trouble that place. But what faith says. It says you are going to speak. In accordance with what is available in grace. And whatever that you say by the spirit of faith. Grace then moves. When grace hears the language of faith. It becomes activated. And it rushes into your destiny. And things begin to be aligned in this area. Now, when God comes and speaks to you. God never speaks to you at the level of what you are going through. He speaks to you at the level of your faith. The language is here. 
Why? Because he's trying to affect that which grace has made available in destiny. Prof, won't you go back that side? Okay, you, 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 you go back that side. However, if you sit here and the articulations of your life are influenced, are dominated and controlled by what seems to be wrong, that reality doesn't change. It's not like grace is no longer available. Your destiny doesn't change, but you become stagnant in this place. You build a stronghold by the influence of what you are going through. And you, you cannot come out of it because it has become the confessions of your mouth. Now, the word confess in the scriptures, in the Bible, in the New Testament, when you see that word confess, it's, it's two words in the Greek. It's homo, and the word homo means the same, right? And logia, where you get the word logos. So that means is to speak the same. So when you say you confess, we are saying speak by faith what is available in grace. So grace is waiting for faith-filled words. For it to be activated so that it rushes to go deal with your life. And so, so here, here they don't care whether you are educated or not, or what your circumstance is, what, 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 what the level of your skill is. No, there, are, there is fullness that is available there. However, but God, but you can see that I'm struggling. Who's ever felt like I've, I've had those moments, like, but... Like, God, I know. Why must I keep telling you, God? Because you can see that this thing is actually taking place. But here's the problem. It was, go back to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, 26. God says, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can see. Remember Genesis 1, 26, he said, let's create men. In our own like this. Let them have dominion. So there is what we call the laws of territory and dominion. These laws say, Pastor Jeff, won't you come here again? This is, oh no, no, Pastor Tabo, Pastor Jeff, come. Pastor Tabo, won't you stand? You remember that Pastor Tabo was God and he released grace from the realms of the spirit. Now, there are laws that then govern this thing. In the laws of territory and dominion, David puts it this way. He says, the heavens is the Lord. Let's say this is heaven, right? The heavens is the Lord. Let's say that is the earth. The earth he has given to the sons of men. So if this is the earth, you are the son of men. The earth has been given to you as a, as a gift, right? And then there was a law that was established. And the law was, let the sons of men have dominion. In other words... It does not matter how much we want to help. Heaven wants to help the sons of men in the earth. It is the sons of men that have dominion here. Heaven doesn't have dominion. Heaven sees that you are suffering. But they are saying it's not our territory. The only way we can come into the territory is if you invite us. You must come invite us. But for you to invite us. There is a law and a principle that we respond to and is called faith. So now when you stand by faith, so this is faith and this is the totality of heaven. Won't you guys put your, your shoulders on him? Once this man believes, then heaven partners with him and then enters, go there. And now heaven, go, go with him as a sponsor. Heaven can now enter his sphere of dominion. So, God, you see I'm suffering. He says, I see. But there are laws. And these worlds have laws. It's, it's not that God is not merciful. It's not that God does not want to work. But God is bound. Has he not exalted his word above his name? So it holds him back. I, 
are you, are you, are you, are you, are you with me, guys? So we are saying, okay, come back, come back this side, guys. So we are saying the number one law that activates faith is confession. So when you now start to speak right, say speak right. When you now start to speak right, your speakings, what, what is speaking right? I'm not going to speak what is going on. I'm going to speak what is available here. And what is it that's available is riches, is prosperity, money that is available. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Number two. Okay, let's, how are we going to do this? Okay, you guys sit down. Pastor Tatiso and Pastor Mike, stay. Okay, you, you can sit down. The number two thing that faith employs when it works, particularly in the area of the grace that makes rich, is generosity. Say it with me. Say generosity. generosity. What is generosity? Generosity is the heart that gives. Do you guys know that there was a man in the Bible called the centurion? Have you ever heard of the centurion? So, okay, sit down guys for a moment. Thank you so much. The centurion is this gentleman who has a child that is a servant, sorry, a servant that is sick uh, and is at home. And I can, I can imagine probably this servant was a good employee, good guy, family man. Uh, and, uh, and then, so he hears about Jesus. He goes, he thought, he thinks, okay, this guy has been doing miracles. I'll go to him and I'll ask him. And uh, Jesus says, okay. No, and then they convince Jesus about the centurion. The Jews, they say, this centurion is a good guy. He's been building synagogues for us. He will take out money and build synagogues for us. He respects our religion. God says, okay, because of this, I will then come and heal your seven. Then the centurion says, Lord Jesus, you don't have to. He then starts to talk to him about what we call authority. He says, because I'm a man in authority... I say to one person, go, and they go, and I say to another person, come. So in other words, when I stand in authority, this authority, whatever that I speak to moves by authority. Are you guys with me? He says, I say to, okay, Pastor Mike, And no, no, you, you, yeah, yeah, the strength of a preacher. Pastor Mike, go sit down. I'm in authority. Right? I can say to him, I can say to him, go. This is like if you have a boss at work, your boss giving you an instruction. This is what you are to do. Now, I, I, a few months ago, maybe this was last year, I don't remember the time exactly, the Holy Spirit asked me, he said, do you want to have authority over money? Who would like to have authority over money? Yeah, right? You want to say, you want to, say to money, come, money, go. Okay. Okay, you want mainly money cometh, right? Yeah. Okay, here's what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said, like the centurion, before you can say to one, come, you must say to one, go. And he said to me, when you become generous, you are telling money, go. In the same power by which you tell money, go, it is the same power that allows for you to say money, come. And let's explain that. Let's explain that in a little bit more of details. Can you say the word prosperity? prosperity. Do you guys want to do well? Do you want to do well? Yes. Yeah. Can I share a testimony with you guys? Just take a commercial break. Then I'll, under, I'll explain my next part and I'm going to close. Mm. So about... Three or four weeks ago, I, I flew to Zimbabwe for, for some time of, time of ministry. It was just so glorious. And I sat in a hotel. So they booked a hotel for us. Um, I was there for about two days. And for the two days, 
day and night I was sitting in this hotel and it's like have you ever watched when it's windy outside I sat in my hotel room and it was like there was a wind inside my hotel room but it was a spiritual wind and this wind was currencies of money like I could, it's like I could hear money flowing it never flowed my direction unfortunately you know I entered Zimbabwe and came out of Zimbabwe and, all, and, I, was, and I was so expectant. I thought, I thought people were going to put money in my hands, you know? But when I was hearing these currencies of money, I, I, it's like I did not really know what to do with it. You know, do I, do I command? Do I receive? But, but I had an expectation. It's okay. I entered the land, exited the land. Um, oh, Okay. <laughs> nothing came on Tuesday I'm sitting in my office at church I'm about, I'm about to leave God says to me I want you to take every foreign currency that you have and it so happened that the week before some people gave me euros and pounds and, and some dollars so I had European and American currencies God directs me is give it to this man. When you give it to, to the man, he's going to pray for you. So I did that on, was it Tuesday or Wednesday night? Wednesday night, Wednesday night. I, I, was, I was with your pastor. So Wednesday night, I give the money to this man. I kneel. And his wife gives me a word. He says, there's loads of money that's coming. Who doesn't want a word like that? You know? Yeah. Yeah, like, hey, please, just keep those words coming. Um, and then on Friday we drive back and it was just a simple act of obedience ne? just a simple act God said to this and I've learned to not argue with God I've also learned that uh, this rain ne? okay they're going to increase my volume so we can compete with, with the rain the simple act of obedience and then Friday I get a call from a man I've not seen in 20 years he says to me God has given me an instruction that I must carry your ministry financially so so what conferences are coming up and what 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 are the budgets right and it's not a chance, to, you know there's chance takers, ne? <laughs> and then there's people that I've seen over the years money flow, flow into their hands. But I want to say, I'm sharing this testimony to say, money cometh, responded to money goeth. It's the system of generosity. But it's not just a willy-nilly generosity is a generosity that is backed by faith to the service um, generosity is everything that you give to God nobody loses by giving everything you give awaits for you in your future anything that you have given it's waiting for you in your future okay let me give you guys an example so in the just in the morning um, we're getting ourselves ready uh, to to go to church and my wife puts on her hair no? yeah um, Yes, it's her hair. She bought it with her money. Yeah. Oh, belongs to her. Um, and she says to me, she says, you know, I've just remembered how, how God is so good. Since when she used to go to the office, there were three specific ladies that just looked at her hair. So your hair is so lovely. I, I wish I had the money to afford the hair you have. I'm like, okay, I'm going to give it to you. Three different ladies. Right now, she's got somebody in our church that just supplies her with 
with hair. Me, I did not know that there's hair like for 50,000. You know, Pastor Jeff. 50. <laughs> this is the very hair of Jesus. I don't know. But, um, yeah. And, 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 and she says, I, I, I don't have to ask for it. Because there's something about what you release from you now. Giving, Satan has made many to be offended at it. He's made people not to excel in the grace of generosity. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big offense. But the more people are offended at this, there's stuff that cannot be released to them. I, I, are you with me, guys? So, I think I'm going to end here for today just because of time. So that I'm not saying a lot of things. These are the two divine instruments by which faith to access grace for riches. There's about, there's about seven of them specified in the scripture. One is speaking. Second is generosity. Now, if... If you give, can somebody give me a note, any, any amount? Just, just, just a note. I want to show you a, a certain principle about, about giving. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, it's all right. Bless you. Bless you. If you give, Pastor Tatish or Pastor Mike, just, you just, yeah. One on the right, one on the left. Yeah. Yeah, Zebedee's wife's request has been granted today. Okay, you go. So, yeah, you, you, you stand towards, towards your pole. Pastor Tati, so let's say you take this money, hold this money. If this is the altar of God, say altar. Okay. I know there was a teaching that says this is not an altar, it's just a stage. No? But it is. It is. It is an altar. If you give, let's say you bring your money and you give in the altar, right? Yeah. So you go back, you sit down. You've not lost this money. Here's what happened. Come, come again. When you give the money, the altar transports it into a future that will dawn on you. Right? Now you go back. Then the altar puts the money here. When you go, when you come back here, what you say about yourself financially is no you don't say, I don't have. You can't start a sentence by I don't have. Because who you are in a future, come, come, come to us, future. The future that is approaching has in it what you have given. However, here's the principle. Whatever that you saw, when the future dawns come, it comes multiplied. Now, what you say, you go back again, what you now say here must be in accordance with what is unfolding. Because it is possible that you have now given, but when your confessions are wrong, let me show you. As the future dawns, as it comes, stops the things that you say can cut it short and delay it's coming because of the things that you have spoken do, do, do you understand Luke chapter 5 okay sit down guys look 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 chapter 5 let's we, we, this is our final scripture look chapter 5 who's ever given an offering any, any, even if it was two bob, any, anybody, you've just given an, you've, you've once given an offering. Almost all of us, right? All of you, that money awaits for you. Do you understand when we say future? Maybe uh, let's make simple English. It's five past, it's ten past five right now. Ten past six is the future because it's not yet come. So that money could be in the next hour of your life. 
but here's what the Bible says. The power of life and death is where? In fact, the scripture, the next verse says, the man's belly shall be filled by the words of his tongue. Do you know that? It says what you eat is determined by your confessions. So, so as, as the future was dawning to bring back, because there are principles here, in these realms. And one of the principles is that when you sow, you reap. One of the principles is that what you, when, whatever that you give is given back to you. And it's not a one-sided principle. However, you are the one that intercepts the working of the principles and you cause stagnation for yourself because you are not speaking right. Does this make sense to you? Okay, just last scripture. I know we've been going on for quite, a, for quite a bit. And it came to pass as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. He stood by the lake Gennesareth uh -huh, and saw two ships standing by the lake. The fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. I want us to just if you can hear me for the next five minutes with this, uh, with this story. Uh, guys, I'm going to ask you to come back. Is that okay? I know you don't mind. So, Jesus, go back to verse 1. What is Jesus doing there? He was teaching the word. So this is Jesus. Jesus is teaching the word. He's doing something that is spiritual, right? He's teaching the word. As he teaches the word, in verse 2, put up verse 2, he then sees two ships. Okay, can I have somebody else? Yeah. Yeah. He sees these two boats, and uh, the owners of the boat, can you three guys just stand as the owners of the boat? I just want to make this, if you already understand and you feel this is unnecessary, won't you be patient with me and other people that we really want for them to get this? So, so he's, he's doing something spiritual, preaching is spiritual, he's teaching the word of God. And do you know when you preach what we do? Everything that we preach is reality hangs around us. Because words are spirits. So if we speak the words of prosperity, the reality of prosperity hangs around us. That anybody that believes then pulls it down to become the reality of their lives. That's how it works. That's why all graces begins at truth, as we said. So as he's teaching... He sees the two boats, he sees the guys. The guys aren't necessarily concerned for whatever that the man is saying. The guys are concerned for the provision of their lives. We, we, we are at work, uh, Murudi, please, this is not time for verses. Uh, right now we are working. Okay? So they see this guy, he sees they are there, and then he sees the guys washing their nets. And then the next verse, I want you please to walk with me on this. And he entered into one of the ship, which was Simon's, and prayed that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat and he taught the people out of the ship. So now he comes to Simon and he says, Simon, can I borrow one of your ships? Right? So he takes Simon's ship, all right? And he's going to use it. Now he is taking what is natural from Simon and is going to use it for spiritual purposes. So what has happened now is that the nature and the position of the ship is being shifted from carrying the guys to do fishing now into doing spiritual work. Okay, so let's take an example up with you. You go to work and you earn money. The money that you earn is to support yourself, to live a good life, if you have a family, if you have children, to support your children. When you take this money and you bring it to where the gospel is being preached, you have shifted the purpose and the position of your money. That it no longer does what it was supposed to do. It now comes to the gospel. As soon as its nature and position is shifted, it's no longer called money. It's called an offering. Okay? It's called what? Yeah. Now, in the Old Testament, offerings had to be banned. And that word, ban, simply means to rise up higher. 
to move from one from a lower level to a higher level just like that's why they it had to be the smoke that rises if the smoke rises up all the way to God they knew that the offering has been accepted so once the boat moves from the fishermen to be used by Jesus is no longer a boat is now an offering in the spirit is no longer recognized just as woods that can float on water in the spirit is now because its nature has been changed even the laws that govern the boat are going to change okay look at then what happens next next verse now when he had left speaking he said to simon launch into the deep and let your nets for a drought what someone responds and says what someone answered said unto him master we have toiled all night so so we are working it's not that you don't have a job it's not that you don't work hard it's not that you are not qualified it's not that you are not doing business you you are toiling here he says we, we've been working is, 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 can you guys see that he says master we've been doing what we are working but we have taken nothing this very thing apostle why is he nakwela nekere ki said keep keep lead zimba ebe i don't know what's 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 been going on but the word that is now proceeding it's proceeding out of a man of authority because you have something that you have changed its position you have changed its nature on the basis of because now your money has been used for the gospel the gospel brings its reality to you he says well we've been working but at your word and then what happens and when they had done they when they had when they had this done they enclosed a great multitude of fish and they are not break so what where, where, where was the fish because naturally they are toiling every labor is worth of its wages isn't it's a natural law that we work hard but whatever that we need does not respond to work whatever that you need it does not respond to the hard work and the toil no 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 it doesn't respond to that what causes a response in this life is when what you would have used for natural means you surrender to the lord and when he speaks he speaks on the basis of what you gave to him and he says what is about to happen to you is not because of what you have done but it's because of the generosity of faith a new reality is going to be created over your life so some of you tomorrow morning are going to go to the same office same boss same dynamics same grumpy people who just seem to when they see you they just become even much more grumpier same environment but this time around in the realms of the spirit there's something that you took from that work and you shifted its position and you say to the master because i have shifted positioning of what i used to toil now speak on the basis of what i have given Now Peter realizes something. Peter has a situation and he has facts. I you don't understand that it is said that the 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 last 10 businesses that were started here. You know what you know statistics was you know they say that in South Africa only 10% of the business that actually get registered at CIPC only 10 is it 10% of your 25 about 10% of those businesses succeed. So for every 10 businesses that gets registered only one succeeds. You know? You know but you don't understand that you know here if you're going to get this tender you know you must be under high handed you must 
you, you don't understand, you know? But you, you don't qualify. And we hear that you're saying you can do more, but you don't have the paper to prove for it. Peter, that's what Peter is doing to the Lord. We, we've toiled all night. In fact, we are just washing our nets. We're going to wrap up our nets. I mean, and you know, they, they were fishing because fish are also nocturnal, so they come up in the night. So these guys were fishing all day. And then they were wrapping up to go back home to report zero. What, what a waste of life. But if you want to break that, surrender your boat to the gospel. Are, are, are you with me, guys? Somebody said, no, me, I don't give to a church. I give to the poor. There are laws that govern these things. We, we give to the altar because whatever you lay in the altar, you have changed its nature and its position. It becomes an offering. The offering, when it comes, goes up. All offerings, when they go up, what is up comes down. Th that's it. If people have sinned and they give a burnt offering, when the smoke becomes a sweet smelling aroma, then the glory of God comes down. So the, it, the, the smoke did not create the glory. The glory was always there. But what unlocked the fish was the giving of the boat for the sake of the one who needed to preach the gospel. So we don't, our generosity in the gospel is we don't, we don't just give because, you know, as I said, we feel manipulated, we feel compelled. No. We understand that this is a spiritual transaction. Some of you guys that have been here for a while, like you have, have been toiling all night. If you have put efforts and your efforts have not yielded anything, what you are dealing with if you worked, if you put five more hours to your work, you'll still be here. When I was younger at work, we used to have this thing that we'll sit in the office long. When, before you could work from home, I'm talking like 2005, 2006, and we used to have, then from like half past eight at night and ten, we'll sit in the office, then we'll start to work, send emails and and our boss will come in the next day and will be so impressed. So you guys were here, you know? So we could play the whole day and then start to work just so that we say, you see, we've been toiling. We've been working. Sometimes you can do that to no avail. What releases the breakthrough that causes for the net to break. Imagine if tomorrow you had money that was so much that you needed people to come help you spend the money. Because that's the whole point. God never gives you for your sake. He gives you so that you can help others. You know when people start to pray for you. To say God keep this woman. Because for as long as the woman is kept we are fine. Okay thank you guys. Thank you. So these are just some truths. These are truth, say truth, upon which grace flows. Has this made sense to you guys? So much sense, eh? Okay. My time is up. Is there anyone with a question? <laughs>